surrounded by the narrow, shivering summer and sunset seas. The continent of Westeros was originally populated by giants and children of the forest during the Dawn Age, before the migration of First Men through the Arm of Dorne in the south. After a lengthy war that saw this land bridge sink into the ocean, a peace pact gave way to the legendary Age of Heroes where men spread throughout the continent, while giants retreated into the far north and the children into the deep forests. Adopting the old gods of the children, the first men prospered for millennia, even defeating a horrifying invasion by White Walkers during the long night around 8,000 years before conquest. Yet in time, the First Men too were supplanted by foreign invaders, conquered by the fair-haired seven worshipping Andals from the Axe Essos, who migrated west to escape the expanding power of Old Valyria and their dragon lords. After some time living in Andalos, the Andals led a religious crusade against Westeros, conquering every kingdom of the continent save for the large and powerful north, where House Stark ruled over the last realm of the First Men. Although the Endals reigned over the south, in many cases they intermarried with and adopted the traditions of the defeated, most notably in the Iron Islands, where many abandoned the Seven to worship the drowned god of the local population. Around 700 years before conquest, the last major migration into Westeros occurred when Princess Nymeria led what remained of a 10,000-ship Rhoynar refugee fleet to escape the Dragon Lords of Valyria who conquered their city-states along the Rhoyne River in Essos. After failing to settle Sothorios, Nath, and the Summer Isles, Nymeria arrived in Dorne and married the Andal leader of House Martell, creating an alliance that conquered the territory, finally creating a new homeland for her people. Intermixing with the local population, Westeros was then unknown as a land of Andals, Rhoynar, and First Men. Carving up the continent into seven kingdoms, south of the Ice Wall marking their northern border, Westeros became a target for yet another invasion in 2 BC, when the Dragon Lord Aegon the Conqueror of House Targaryen, patriarch to the last of the 40 great Valyrian families, led his army west from his home of Dragonstone to establish the Aegon Fort, which later became the capital of King's Landing. Conquering six of seven kingdoms, Dorne was eventually brought into the realm through a marriage alliance in 187 AC. Though the Targaryens seemed invincible, the dance of the dragon's civil war and aftermath led to a significant loss in power and influence due to the death of their dragons and dragon riders, allowing Lord Robert Baratheon to overthrow Mad King Aerys II in 283 AC, ending the first Targaryen dynasty. Although the history of Westeros was no doubt fascinating to the scholarly maesters of the Citadel, it was only one continent in a great wide world, with many other lands and peoples to explore. Yet as difficult as it was to write the history of their own lands, relying on legends, rumors, physical evidence, and whatever written records survived the long years, it was even more difficult to discern truth from fiction when relying on second-hand accounts of other lands from sometimes dubious sources, with few opportunities for first-hand knowledge or travel to these regions. As a result, information about the outside world was increasingly unreliable the further one ventured from Westeros, becoming a mix of myth, legend, and reality. Moving south, there were the Summer Isles, surrounded by the Summer Sea, a largely peaceful, friendly, trade-oriented region populated by a seafaring, ebony-skinned people. Consisting of three relatively large territories surrounded by smaller islands, the cultural center of these lands was Tall Trees Town, where priestesses carved their history onto enormous talking trees. Unintelligent, relatively enlightened, polytheistic people who spoke the summer tongue, their most revered deities governed love, beauty, and fertility, believing intimacy a holy virtue and prostitution a noble profession practiced by nobles and commoners alike. Preferring trade to battle, the islands never attempted to invade another land, but were nonetheless subject to many raids from slavers and pirates throughout the years. While unification did occur, they were traditionally governed as independent islands, with disputes settled through ritualistic warfare, where teams of warriors battled on consecrated grounds with spears and slings. Resembling a Westeros attorney more than a battle, the winners took the disputed prize while the losers were exiled. As a result, island warfare did not harm civilians or property. Some notable information. Throughout their early history, they thought they were alone in a world of ocean. The islands produced some of the best archers and bows in the world. They produced famed swan ships. They may have explored southern Sothorios but kept the information and maps to themselves. The Isle of Women was populated by Rhoynar refugees. Robert Baratheon considered invading the islands on behalf of Jalabar Zo, the exiled prince of the Red Flower Vale who was living in his court. Moving east across the Summer Sea was the Island of Noth, or Isle of Butterflies, populated by a beautiful, gentle, dark-skinned people with golden eyes, committed to pacifism even in self-defense, or for sustenance, eating fruit rather than flesh, and making music rather than war. 
a monotheistic people who worshipped the Lord of Harmony. They believed the many butterflies on the island were messengers of their deity charged with their protection. And indeed, it was the illness butterfly fever that prevented any outside power from conquering the island. Due to their reputation for non-violence, the Nathi were often targeted by slavers. However, any outsider who spent more than a few days on the island contracted the fatal butterfly fever, forcing them to leave or die. Yet even so, coastal raids were still possible, forcing the Nathi to migrate further inland. East of Nath and northwest of Sothorios were the infamous Basilisk Isles, named for the beasts that once roamed these lands. A hot, humid region plagued by stinging flies, sand fleas, and bloodworms. Life on the isles was nasty, brutal, and short, yet ruins on several of the islands and the native people on the Isle of Toads suggested an ancient civilization may have ruled over these lands in the distant past. In more modern times, the old empire of Gis founded the colony Gorgai on the isles, which was later conquered by the Valyrians and turned into the penal colony Gogosos. Though Gagosos thrived as a slave port for a time after the Doom of Valyria, the outbreak of the Red Death Plague wiped out nine-tenths of the population, leaving it to become a lawless backwater, home to murderers, exiles, pirates, and sellswords. The worst of humanity gathered seeking others of their kind. Bordered by the summer and jade seas, stories named Sothorios, a land of vicious wildlife, savage natives, and deadly diseases, with only its northern coast properly mapped. A vast land of bountiful resources, Sothorios was populated by the Sothori or Brindled Men, a large, relatively primitive, well-muscled people with thick, dark skin brindled in white patterns, considered intellectually inferior by some, but valued as slave pit fighters due to their strength and skill as warriors. Yet while natives of the north were often raided and enslaved, traveling further south or inland meant encountering populations far more fearsome and territorial, which were believed to practice cannibalism and horrific religious rituals in worship of dark gods. Yet the native Sothori represented only a minor danger when compared to the far deadlier threat of vicious wildlife and deadly disease, with Archmaester Ebros claiming nine of every ten Westerosi travelers to Sothorios would contract an illness, and of those half would die. Similar to the Basilisk Isles, ruins like the mysterious abandoned city of Yin, constructed from oily black stone, suggested an ancient civilization once populated the region. Though the Giscari Empire established the walled city of Zamitar at the mouth of the Zamios River and the penal colony of Gorosh at Wyvern Point, these colonies were eventually conquered by the Dragon Lords of Old Valyria. Yet as the years went on and harsh conditions kept migration sparse, these colonies were slowly abandoned to piracy and ruin. Some notable information. During the Age of Valyria, the dragon rider Genera Balerus flew her dragon Terax as far south as possible, hoping to find the southernmost edge of Sothorios, but after three years returned home, claiming to have only found jungle, deserts, and mountains, calling it a land without end. For a time, Princess Nymeria and her Roinar refugees settled the region, yet over the course of their first year suffered so many raids and plagues they had to depart. The final calamity occurred when a ship discovered the entire population settled in Yi vanished overnight. At the height of their power, Gagosos was considered the tenth free city. North of Sothorios was the great continent of Essos, stretching from the narrow sea in the west to the very edges of the known world in the east. Yet while its furthest reaches were mysterious lands of myth and magic, the free cities directly across the narrow sea to Westeros were well known to the maesters of the citadel. Engaging in trade, diplomacy, and occasionally warfare, the histories of these lands were intertwined since the Dawn Age, when the first men of Essos migrated west over the Arm of Dorne. Years later, this connection continued between the Seven Kingdoms and Free Cities, nine powerful city-states, eight of which were founded or conquered by Old Valyria, before eventually gaining their independence when the once lush, beautiful lands of the Valyrian Peninsula were shattered and left a smoking ruin. Known as the Doom of Valyria, it was believed the 14 Flames volcano chain erupted, either naturally or by some unknown means, wiping out the local population. What remained was a land plagued by terrible diseases and a haunting presence where travel was eventually forbidden by Westerosi kings. After such a sudden tragedy, the fallout resulted in a century of blood where former Valyrian settlements like the Free Cities struggled to secure their newly won independence. Starting in the north, there was Lorath, the poorest and most isolated of the free cities, a bleak settlement upon a stony island ruled by a council of magisters under the Harvest Prince, Fisher Prince, and Prince of the Streets. The Lorathi Isles were originally inhabited by ancient maze makers, but after their fall were contested by numerous peoples until united under the Andal King Carlon the Great. Expanding his empire, Carlon conquered much of the Andal North, but met his end after attacking nearby Norvos, a city of the Valyrian Freehold, which sent their dragonlords to destroy the enemy king in the scouring of Lorath. 
1436 BC, Valyrian worshippers of the blind god Boash settled a colony on the largest island, where they practiced their strict religious beliefs, like absolute egalitarianism, refusing to eat flesh or drink wine, following eunuch priests, walking barefoot, wearing simple clothing, and denying the self, referring to themselves as a man or a woman instead of I or me. The city Carlon could not conquer. Norvos was once populated by an ancient civilization before finding itself settled by hairy men, who were then driven off by the Roinar. Left abandoned for a time, it was claimed by religious dissidents from Valyria, seeking to establish a theocracy ruled by secretive bearded priests that hid the name of their god and practiced ritual flagellation. As only priests were allowed to grow beards, men favored long mustaches, while women shaved off all their hair but wore wigs to receive guests. A unique feature of this region was that the people's lives were governed by the ringing of three bells, which determined when they slept, rose, worked, rested, prayed, and had intimate relations. Southeast of Norvos, Kohor was renowned as the City of Sorcerers, founded over a lumber colony by yet another sect of religious dissidents from Valyria, though these worshipped the Black Goat, a dark god that demanded daily blood sacrifices, including animals for regular days, human criminals for holidays, and the children of nobles during times of war. When Kohor stood on the precipice of total annihilation during the Century of Blood, facing a Dothraki army of 25,000, which quickly crushed most of their forces, the defense of their city was left to 3,000 brave Unsullied slave soldiers, trained their whole lives for combat. Though only 600 Unsullied survived, they killed 12,000 Dothraki, including their leader Kal Temo and his sons, which in addition to the 5,000 killed in the initial fighting, caused the Dothraki to surrender, cutting off their braids in shame. From that point forward, Kohor was primarily protected by Unsullied, who tied the braids of defeated Dothraki to their weapons. The nearest free city to the capital of Westeros, the history, politics, and culture of Pentos was often intertwined with their neighbors across the narrow sea, existing as an Andal town before submitting to Old Valyria. Growing into a wealthy trade port ruled by a council of magisters, the city also had a prince who lived in abject luxury, responsible for overseeing balls and feasts, in addition to deflowering two virgin girls each year in a religious ritual that ensured continued prosperity. However, this life of luxury came at a cost, as any famines or lost wars meant slitting the prince's throat to appease the gods and win back their favor. Located in the south of the continent, the sister cities of Mir, Lys, and Tyrosh shared culture, customs, language, and religion, but were nonetheless embroiled in endless wars over the fertile lands near their borders. Ruled by a conclave of wealthy magisters, Mir was an artisan city known for producing goods of exceptional quality, founded by Valyrian adventurers that conquered an Endal city, while the island realm of Lys was famous for training pleasure slaves, as they were a people of incredible beauty, sharing the physical traits of old Valyria, including silver gold hair, fair skin, and violet eyes. Ruled by a conclave of wealthy magisters, under the first magister, Lys was founded as a trade port by wealthy Valyrian merchants, and while some few dragonlords on the island survived the doom of Valyria, the people rose up and killed their dangerous dragons. Founded as a military outpost for old Valyria, dye production allowed Tyrosh to explode into a wealthy trade city known for its aggressive merchants and slavers. Ruled by a conclave of wealthy nobles under an archon, Tyroshi wore bright colors and crafted ornate helmets and armor, but ultimately considered trade more honorable than warfare. Constantly hiring mercenary companies to wage wars over the disputed lands, the sister cities have known times of peace and cooperation, including when they formed the Kingdom of the Three Daughters. Yet this ended in disaster after they sided with the usurper King Aegon II in the Westerosi Dance of the Dragon Civil War. Losing so many ships, it sparked a political crisis, leading to the dissolution of the kingdom and fresh conflict between them. Oldest of the free cities, Valantis was founded as a Valyrian colony at the mouth of the Rhoyne River, eventually leading to the conquest of the local Rhoynar city-states around 700 BC. A large, wealthy city with deep ties to the Freehold, they considered themselves the heirs of old Valyria, attempting to conquer the other free cities after the Doom. Yet after taking Lys and Mir, their efforts were halted during the invasion of Tyrosh, when a great alliance of local powers pushed them back to their city. Ruled by three triarchs elected by the citizenry each year, they had two major political parties, with the Tigers representing the old aristocracy, while the Elephants spoke for the merchant class. The only free city never under the rule of old Valyria, Bravos was founded by runaway slaves of mixed ethnicity, cultures, and beliefs, which created a prosperous trade port in a hidden lagoon where all religions and peoples were accepted. However, it was some time before they freely allowed outsiders into their realm, keeping the existence of their city hidden from possible Valyrian reprisal. 
Yet eventually, they revealed themselves and financially compensated Valyria for the losses incurred during their escape, which satisfied the Dragon Lords. Despite banning the slave trade, Bravos became the wealthiest of the free cities and home to the famous Iron Bank, using their mighty fleets to intervene in foreign wars when they deemed necessary. Intertwined in the history of nearby Westeros as well as the other free cities, their influence was most profoundly felt in Pentos, which after losing a series of wars, was forced to abandon the slave trade. Once a home to great and powerful empires, the far-reaching grasslands of the Dothraki Sea were home to nomadic Dothraki horse lords, copper-skinned warriors who earned the right to braid their hair through victory in combat. A polytheistic people, their most revered deity was a horse god which claimed deceased warriors for his starry Kalisar, roaming the Nightlands. They also believed the sun and moon were gods wed to each other, while the earth itself was a mother to their people, causing them to burn farms and large settlements, which dug into the ground and destroyed nature. To sustain themselves, the Dothraki raised horses for mounts as well as food, leather, and milk, while also regularly raiding other lands to either steal their wealth or extract tributes. As their culture frowned upon direct trade, Dothraki offered gifts while conducting business and expected gifts in return. Most commonly dealing in slaves, Dothraki not only warred with other lands but also against each other, as Kalisars often competed for dominance. Yet the shedding of freedmen blood was forbidden in Vase Dothrak, the heart of Dothraki culture located by the Mother of Mountains and Womb of the World Lake, home to the wives of slain Kals and their slave servants. These former Khaleesis served as Dosh Kalin, advisors and oracles greatly respected by the Kals. Migrating from east of the Bone Mountains, the Dothraki set out to conquer their new homeland, targeting nearly every realm of central Lesos, including smaller settlements like the former Valyrian colony Asaria, renamed Vase Kadak, or City of Corpses, Yinshar near the Bone Mountains, which became Vase Gini, meaning City of Goats, and possibly Arakakeleki, meaning the Cannibals. Originally settled in the prosperous grasslands of central Essos, the pale-skinned Kothi people often warred with the nearby kingdom of Sarnor, but after losing many of these conflicts, migrated southeast. Yet just as these new towns and cities started to prosper, the region began drying out, turning grassland into Red Waste Desert. They then suffered further tragedy during the Century of Blood, when the Dothraki raided and destroyed their holdings, renaming them City of the Whip, City of Spiders, City of Scorpions, and City of Bones. Fortunately for the people of Karth, they survived thanks to its triple walls, and in time even expanded, building colonies like Karkash and Port Yos, while establishing themselves as a major trade port between East and West. Known as an overtly polite people who greatly valued individual property rights, the people of Karth were ruled from the Hall of a Thousand Thrones by an assembly of pureborn claiming descent from ancient monarchs. However, true power and influence was shared with local economic interests, represented by the Guild of the Thirteen, the Tourmaline Brotherhood, and the ancient Guild of Spicers. In addition to conquering the Kathi lands of the south, the Dothraki ventured north, attacking the ancient kingdom of Sarnor, which was in fact a collection of independent city-states, often at war with each other. Claiming descent from Huzor Amai, son to the last Fisher Queen, ruling over the ancient realm surrounding the Silver Sea, the Tall Men, as they were known, built beautiful settlements like Sathar, the Waterfall City, and traded with foreign powers near and far. Refusing to take the Dothraki threat seriously, Sarnori kings sent gifts to the Khals, encouraging them to invade regional rivals. As a result, the city-states started to fall, and it was not until the loss of Mardosh that the remaining rulers united under Mazor Alexi, who became the last High King of Sarnor. Though they raised a mighty host, they were slaughtered by four Kalisars at the Field of Crows, and all their lands destroyed, save for the port city of Soth, the last settlement of the Tall Men. Having thoroughly conquered the Sarnori and Kothi, the Dothraki next led a generational campaign against the mainland colony Ibish, held by the realm of Ibn upon the Isle of Ib, home to squat, heavyset people known as ferocious warriors, as well as great craftsmen and artisans. A land rich in metals, minerals, timber, amber, and pelts, the Ibanese were also known as great whalers, with their ships often traveling great distances. A distinct people, the Ibanese had difficulties producing children with human mates, as offspring were often malformed or sterile. Therefore, they were largely an isolationist power, keeping to their own affairs while restricting the rights of foreigners in their lands. Ruled by god kings, the Ibanese once expanded into a mighty empire, but by around 100 AC, Ibish was their greatest remaining colony. Though they successfully defended it for a time, continuous raids by Dothraki forces forced them to abandon the city and return to their island home. Angry that they were robbed of a final battle, the Dothraki burned Ibish and renamed the ruins Vase Arasak, meaning City of Cowards. 
in time. The Ibanese established the small port city of New Ibish on a peninsula protected by strong walls, but never again reached the heights of years past. Settling towns and villages in the grasslands west of the Red Waste, the peaceful, copper-skinned sheep herders of Lazar were regular targets for Dothraki raids, called Lamb Men because they were considered poor fighters. A monotheistic people, the Lazarine, worshipped the Great Shepherd, who taught that all men were one flock. Yet not all the realms of central Essos were ravaged by the Horse Lords, as the city-states of Slaver's Bay thrived after the Doom, using their wealth to pay off Kalasars that ventured near their lands. Once part of the old empire of Gis, Astapor, Yunkai, and Mirin were home to the amber-skinned Giskari people who specialized in the training and sale of slaves. Though the old empire fell and Slaver's Bay was ruled by Valyria for a time, the Doom gave them independence, allowing them to thrive in the Century of Blood, providing a market for the Dothraki to sell the many slaves they captured. Taking great sport in pit fighting, the Giskari sacrificed slaves to honor the gods of old Gis and named their priestesses Graces, with the Green Grace as their most revered religious figure. Though the cities of Slaver's Bay, which later came to include new Gis, had much in common like culture, language, and religion, each was governed independently by an elite aristocracy like the good masters of Astapor, who specialized in training unsullied slave soldiers, the wise masters of Yunkai, who trained prized pleasure slaves, and the great masters of Mirin, known for their ferocious pit fighters. Moving east, beyond the Dothraki Sea, were the Bone Mountains of Central Essos, a large, natural continental barrier that stretched from the Summer and Jade Seas of the south to the Shivering Sea in the north, with only three major roads known to pass through. Named for the many bones left by the Dothraki when they migrated into the grasslands of the west, the mountains were littered with the remains of other creatures as well, like in the realm of Jogwin, where stone giants, twice as large as their Westerosi counterparts, were slain in ancient wars with regional rivals like the Jogos Nai of the east. A nomadic race, famed for their ferocity in battle, the squat, sallow-skinned warriors that roamed the plains of the Jogos Nai, north of the Shrinking Sea, observed a unique cultural practice in which they bound the heads of newborn children to give them pointed skulls. Traveling in small family groups, ruled by a male Jot or warchief, and a female Moonsinger, acting as healer and priestess of their religion. Although males were permitted to become Moonsingers if they wished, they were expected to dress and act like women, while women who wanted to be warriors had to dress and act like men. Known for breeding black and white striped Zors mounts they used in combat, the gods of the Jogos Nai forbid killing their own people, and so domestic conflicts usually involved theft of property or women abducting men from neighboring tribes for marriage. Therefore, the Jogos Nai lived in a perpetual state of war with all neighboring powers, causing great damage to once powerful realms that struggled to withstand their unending attacks. In addition to having chased the Dothraki from their original homeland in the east, it was the chief of chiefs, Garak Squintai, who slew the last stone giant at the battle in the Howling Hills. The Jogos Nai also fought many terrible battles against the patrimony of Hirkun that once ruled near the Great Sand Sea to the west. Though they inflicted great damage on the Jogos Nai, sacrificing thousands of prisoners to their gods, the patrimony eventually collapsed, leaving Kayakaya Naya, Bayasabad, and Shamidiana as independent city-states. Ruled by councils of great fathers, the sister cities were exclusively defended by bare-breasted warrior women trained their whole lives for combat. Men born into this society were tested at an early age, with the most worthy becoming great fathers permitted to breed with the women of the realm, while the other 99 out of 100 boys were made eunuch laborers, gelded to ensure they did not procreate. Southeast of the Patrimony, the Golden Empire of Yi-T was the oldest and arguably greatest of the Eastern civilizations. Wealthier than Valyria and more ancient than Old Gis, described as a land of a thousand gods and a hundred princes, ruled by one god-emperor. A successor state to the Empire of the Dawn that once ruled nearly all of Far Eastern Essos, tragedy struck when the Long Night fell upon the world roughly 8,000 years before conquest, as Eastern tradition states it allowed for an invasion of demon monsters who were only defeated when a hero, some named Azor Ahai, restored light to the world. In order to defend against these monsters, it was believed the Pearl Emperor built five forts from fused black stone in the east, each of which was capable of housing 10,000 men. Collapsing from the years of hardship, the Golden Empire of Yi-T rose from the ashes of what remained, ruled by various dynasties over the years, which sometimes came into conflict over leadership. Yet they faced a far worse threat along their northern border, suffering many raids by the brutal Jogos Nai, forcing Yi-T to dedicate significant resources to defenses, even invading the plains on three occasions, though these campaigns garnered little success. An ancient, proud, polytheistic people, their most notable gods were the Lion of Night who mated with the Maiden Maid of Light to produce the God on Earth that originally ruled the Empire of the Golden Dawn. 
just south of Yi Ti was Leng, a heavily forested and jungled island, home to valuable resources like spices, gemstones, and exotic animals, described as a home to 10,000 tigers and 10 million monkeys. Originally populated by the tall, golden-eyed Lengi, the natives were strict isolationists, ruled by a god empress who worshipped the Old Ones living in the island's subterranean ruins. Even after Leng started accepting merchants from Yi Ti, the Old Ones ordered them to slaughter the foreigners on at least four occasions. Eventually, Yi Ti conquered Leng, sealed the underground ruins, and confined all natives to the southern third of the island. Yet around the year 100 BC, the people of Leng rose up in rebellion and won their independence, once again falling under the rule of a god empress, who this time took two husbands, one of Yi Ti descent, the other Lengi, so that one may be in charge of the army and the other their fleet. While Leng did not wish to be part of the Golden Empire, both realms were able to prosper from the Jade Sea trade route in the waters to the south. Moving through the Jade Gates along the coast of Karth and Great Morak, merchants and adventurers risked the long journey between East and West to trade for silk, gemstones, spices, and other exotic goods that might be sold for high prices in faraway lands. Passing by the Isle of Whips towards the Yi-Ti settlement of Yin, the route then visited Leng and Jinkai before moving south to the mountainous Shadowlands and mysterious city of Ashai. Travelers may then return west, past the Manticore Isles, the island of Marahai, and port city of Zabad, on the coast of the Isle of Elephants, a land ruled by the Shan from a palace of ivory. Moving towards Port Morak, the Jade Sea trade route continued past the Cinnamon Straits, towards Lesser Morak, Vahar, and Pharos, where inhabitants worshipped a stone cow. Although travel to the Far East could provide great riches, long sea voyages presented many dangers, as ships from Pentos, even under the best of circumstances, could take two years to reach the Jade Sea in return. The distance and infrequency of interactions between their peoples also meant travelers were susceptible to foreign diseases, sometimes transporting those illnesses to spread plagues like the Great Death, which struck Pentos, killing over 2,000 people. Yet beyond even the Jade Sea trade route, towards the furthest eastern reaches of the known world, more realms and civilizations existed, but were so distant and rarely contacted that stories of these lands more often resembled myth or legend than reality. Far to the north were the Thousand Islands, which may have once been a civilization that submerged beneath the rising sea. Despite the name, Ibani sailors have only counted about 300 islands, populated by a mysterious, xenophobic race of hairless, green-skinned fish god-worshipping women that filed their teeth into points, and men that performed ritualistic circumcision. A hostile people known to sacrifice sailors to their gods, they were also terrified of the sea, preferring death to touching its waters. South of the islands were the lands of Mosavi, a great grey forest haunted by shape-changers and demon hunters. Then there was the kingdom of Nagai and their sole remaining city Nefer, home to a people kin to the Jogos Nai, enemies which destroyed their other settlements. Nefer, also called the Secret City, was reportedly home to necromancers and torturers. To the southeast, there was the Bleeding Sea, whose waters turned red from a blooming plant, the Cannibal Sands, where inhabitants ate the flesh of men, and the Grey Waste, a cold desert populated by raiders known to attack E.T. forces at the Five Forts. Further south, there was the city-state Kadath, where inhabitants performed horrific rituals to feed their mad gods, the land of Shrieks, home to shrieking monsters, and Bone Town, made entirely out of bone, where travelers could trade for rare and ancient bones recovered from the dry deep region nearby. To the south, bordering the very edges of the known world, were the cities of the Bloodless Men, home to a people as pale as corpses, where some claimed they were undead, brought back to life through dark rituals. North of the Hidden Sea, there was the city of Winged Men, where men with leather wings flew through the air, and to the south was the city Carcosa, which in later years was taken over by an exiled sorcerer, claiming to be the 69th Yellow Emperor of Yi Ti. Moving south, past the Mountains of the Morn, there was the ancient city of Ashai, a dark, dangerous place where no children or animals were found. All religions were accepted, and all manner of magic was practiced. Although food and fresh water were scarce, they were rich in precious metals and gems, trading for what was needed. The legend of Azor Ahai, who vanquished demon armies during the Long Night, may have originated in Ashai, with the followers of the Red God Relore believing he would one day be reborn to fight against a second darkness. Despite being a massive settlement built from oily black stone, only one in ten buildings were occupied. Considered grim on the best of days, the dark and sullen Ashai spoke a shrill, ululating language and largely kept to themselves, walking alone while wearing face coverings, or else traveling in palanquins with dark curtains carried on the backs of slaves. The contaminated Ash River that flowed through the city was black during the day while shining pale green at night, producing fish so blind and deformed only Shadowbinders dared consume them. Despite the sinister reputation surrounding Ashai, the corpse city of Stagai to the east was a yet more daunting location, populated by demons and monsters where even Shadowbinders feared to tread. 
Then there were the Shadowland Mountains, which may have been the original homeland of dragons, but in more modern times was populated by a mysterious people wearing red wooden masks while covered in tattoos. Once considered a significant threat to nearby powers, the Maroon Emperors of Yi Ti moved their court to Jinkai so they might better defend against Shadowmen Reavers. Finally, there was Olthos, located across the Saffron Straits from Ashai, a land of which almost nothing was known, though maps suggested it was heavily jungle, with a river on its western coast and a ruined city on the nearby island of Ulos. Given its distance to Westeros and proximity to other near-mythical locations, maesters could not even be certain whether Ulthos was an independent continent or just a large island, with some even suggesting it might be connected to Sothorios or Essos. A special thanks to all those who contribute to Civilization X, like Sir Darren of House Ashford, Sir Elendil of Numenor, Sir Jeremiah Ironside of House Comsia, and Chris Wilder the Crimson Shadow. If you'd like to help the channel, be sure to give a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and click on the links below, or else go to patreon.com slash civilizationx, where you can gain early access to videos, vote on future content, and watch the Patreon-only series, Heroes of Lore and Legend.